The following presentation was recorded live by Jeline LaRock of ECMO Advantage. ECMO Advantage provides staffing, training, and consulting to hospitals across the country to help them develop and maintain high quality ECMO programs. Thanks so much, Keith, for having me and so happy to chat with all of you today about one of my favorite topics, ECMO. The title of this course is ECMO Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow, and we'll be looking at just that. I may be dating myself, but for my fellow Gen Xers out there, the picture on this slide is the nothing from the never ending story. And while I am the director of sales at ECMO Advantage, we won't be talking about that today. And so I have nothing to disclose. So I think before we get into the history of ECMO, first we need to start with a brief history of critical care. So back in 1953 in Copenhagen, Dr. Bjorn Ibsen, who is known as the father of intensive care, opened the first ICU. And interestingly, it was Dr. Ibsen who suggested positive pressure ventilation to treat the hundreds of victims of the polio epidemic that were experiencing respiratory failure and bulbar palsy. Prior to that, the mainstay for treatment for polio was negative pressure ventilation, more commonly known at that time, and we may know that as respiratory therapists as the iron lung. At the height of the polio epidemic, approximately 70 patients had to be manually ventilated around the clock. And approximately 1,500 medical and dental students were enrolled to work six to eight hour shifts manually ventilating patients. If you can imagine, given our experience in the ICU and attending codes, bagging patients for, well, sometimes 20, 30 minutes, and maybe at times even up to an hour, depending on our institutional protocols and patient-specific situations, that can be a long time to bag a patient. So I can't imagine spending a six or eight hour shift bagging not only a patient, but an awake alert patient must have been interesting times. So let's take a look at the Ambu bags back in 1953. And the tanks that they used to bag the patients off of was interestingly half oxygen, half nitrogen. There was a soda lime absorber that was in line in the Ambu bag that assisted in removing CO2. What really interests me is that the only lab test available at the beginning of the epidemic was total CO2. That is what we commonly refer to as bicarb. So these lab results that they were receiving were reported as a mysterious alkalosis. And in my mind, presumably that was due to a compensated respiratory acidosis and what we would analyze today through blood gas analysis. pH was not added until later on for test results. So can you imagine looking only at bicarb and trying to determine what was going on with your patient? In this picture, we see Dr. Wheel. He is known as the father of modern intensive care. And in the University of Southern California Medical Center, he developed a shock ward in 1958. And this had four beds and was known as the precursor to what we know today as the ICU. So the ICU is still relatively new. So I think we have to look at where we are and where we've been in assisting patients with respiratory distress. And looking at that, I start around the time of 1980 and look at the first successful trial of surfactant for RDS in the newborn patient. To me, being an RT for 19 years now, it's commonplace to use surfactant. So 
it's hard for me to imagine a time before that was available. In 1983, the Puritan Bennett 7200 came out. Some of us may remember using that. That was the first microprocessor ventilator that was put out on the market. In 1993, a landmark study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it looked at the role of nitric oxide in ARDS. In that study, nitric oxide was found to be beneficial in ARDS, and the reason for that being the ability for decreased PA pressures and the, improve, uh, the improvement of arterial oxygenation through improvement of the VQ mismatch. As we all know as RTs, nitric oxide is a potent pulmonary vasodilator. And so those systemic vasodilators that are out on the market don't always work well with our patient's hemodynamics. So this was a big change. And then in 1999, the FDA formally approved the use of nitric oxide. And in its approval, it is listed for use in neonates greater than 34 weeks gestation with hypoxic respiratory failure that was either associated with clinical or echo evidence of pulmonary hypertension. Interesting to note that that still holds true today. I know for myself, I have initiated nitric oxide on pediatric and adult patients for both respiratory failure and cardiac failure, which would be considered off-label use. So that still stands today. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So now that we've talked a little bit about the brief history of critical care, and that was just a very short overview, let's take a look at a brief history of extracorporeal support. The reason I wanted to tie in the brief history of critical care is you'll notice some very um, familiar dates that are associated both with the history of extracorporeal support and critical care. Many of us may just be learning about extracorporeal support when in fact its origins date back to prior to the opening of the first ICU. So between 1931 and 1942, a physician by the name of Dr. John Gibbon worked on the development of a heart-lung machine. In 1952, the first human use of that Gibbon heart-lung machine was used on a 15-month-old patient. With the first successful use in 1953 for an ASD repair. We also have the first use of what is referred to as cross circulation by Dr. Lillehei for a VSD repair in 1954. So looking at those dates, you kind of see a lag between 1942 and 1952. Well, in January of 1942, during World War II, Dr. Gibbon volunteered for enlistment in the Army, where he served in the South Pacific for the next four years. So that halted his work on the heart-lung machine. After returning to the U.S. in 1946, he resumed work, but was faced with two looming obstacles, financial support for his endeavor and the use of the sophisticated engineering to produce that. Well, as luck would have it, through a family relationship, Dr. Gibbon was introduced to the chairman of IBM, Thomas Watson Sr., and he offered his assistance by providing one of his top engineers to assist Dr. Gibbon. With added clinical support from surgical residents, and after great progress with his heart-lung machine and animal experiments, Dr. Gibbon felt it was time to trial his device on a human, and that is the 1952 that we see on the screen. In 
In February of that year, Dr. Gibbon and his team operated on a 15-month-old patient with a clinical diagnosis of an atrial septal defect. However, once they put the patient on bypass, opened the chest, they weren't able to appreciate any ASD. What they did find was a patent ductus arteriosus in the, op in the autopsy report because the patient very sadly expired in the OR. It's important to note that at that time, cardiac catheterization was in its very infancy. Dr. Lillehei, who is known as the father of open heart surgery, and his team performed open heart surgery using a procedure that was quite unusual at that time. He performed cross circulation, which is a procedure where one individual provided oxygenated blood to the other undergoing open heart surgery. This method at the time was an innovative way to keep the cardiac patient's brain and vital organs working while doctors stopped blood flow to the heart for the repair. In most cases, as it was in 1954, the surgery was performed with a child and having the patient, uh, patient's parents supporting by being that oxygenated blood donor. Here's a picture of Dr. John Gibbon, and he was named a fellow at the Massachusetts General Hospital in 1927. He assisted Dr. Edward Churchill in an emergent pulmonary embolectomy in 1930. And at that time, the procedure was one of desperation as no patients in the US had survived the removal of blood clots in open heart surgery. As Dr. Gibbon recorded the patient's waning vital signs prior to the procedure, he thought, if only we could remove the blood from her body by bypassing her lungs, oxygenate it and return it to her heart, we could almost certainly save her life. Well, despite a successful removal of large clots from the patient's pulmonary artery, the patient never regained consciousness. This profound experience would forever change Dr. Gibbon and stimulate the idea to create a device that at the time sounded audacious and impossible. His device would temporarily take the role of both the heart and the lungs to make repairs inside the heart or the great vessels. Here's a picture of the early version of the Gibbon heart lung machine. The profound experience that the patient would forever change Dr. Gibbon and stimulate this idea would lead to a lifelong journey for Dr. Gibbon and translates to what we do here today. The initial Gibbon heart lung machine was the size of a spinet piano. So I have a picture of a modern day spinet piano on the left, uh, just for reference. And you can see the initial Gibbon heart lung machine there on the right. This heart lung machine created thin films of deoxygenated blood passing over a screen exposed to oxygen. It's kind of hard to tell in this picture and unfortunately that's how photography was at the time. But here is a picture of Dr. Gibbon and his OR team using his heart lung machine for its first successful use during the ASD repair in 1953. And here's his patient. This is 18 year old in the picture at the time, Cynthia Bavilek with Dr. Gibbon, who was her surgeon. This is that patient who had the first successful ASD repair in what we refer to as on pump or cardiopulmonary bypass. Talked a little bit earlier about Dr. Lillehei and his interesting use of 
cross circulation in 1954. He had an 11 year old boy who was undergoing a repair of a ventral septal defect. In this procedure, he used cross circulation where the patient's anesthetized father served as the oxygenator. As you can see in the picture, there are two teams. So the team on the right and the table on the right in that picture is the patient's anesthetized father, where you can see the OR team working on the patient on the left. Blood flow was rooted from the patient's cable system to the father's femoral vein and lungs, where it was oxygenated, CO2 was removed, and then the blood was returned back to the patient's carotid artery. Seems a little bit like mad medicine, but in fact, it wasn't that long ago that this was being used. So now let's take a brief look at the history of ECMO. Well, in 1971, the first successful use of ECMO was for a young man who was in a motorcycle accident, suffered a ruptured aorta, and was in ARDS. Now, at that time, we didn't have the term ARDS, and they were not sure what was going on with the patient. However, his physician did know that with the mechanical ventilation they were providing, this patient was not long for this world. She called a physician by the name of Dr. Bob Bartlett to see if the machine he was working on was ready for use. Dr. Bartlett said, well, my machine is not currently uh, seeing successful results in the animal population, but I've got a friend, Dr. J.D. Hill, who I believe his machine may be ready for use. Dr. Bartlett referred this patient's physician to Dr. Hill, who threw his machine in the back of his car and drove it down to the hospital where they initiated support on the patient. In 1972, we have the first successful pediatric ECMO patient that was placed on VA ECMO following a mustard procedure for transposition of the great vessels. And where ECMO really started to take off was in 1975. In 1975, the first use of ECMO for a neonatal patient in respiratory failure after meconium aspiration was achieved. Here's a picture of that first patient back in 1971. The adult, young adult who was in a motorcycle accident and was in ARDS after a repair of his ruptured aorta. It was a successful run lasting approximately 75 hours and the patient was decannulated and survived. Now, if you can imagine looking at that picture, that is a lot different than what the ECMO machines we see in the ICU today look like. Here's a picture of the first pediatric survivor. So in 1972, when this young patient underwent the mustard procedure for the transposition of the great vessels, he came out of the OR post-op. He was acidotic. He wasn't making urine. And so as a last ditch effort, they cannulated him for VA ECMO. Well, after a short run, a little over 36 hours, he was successfully decannulated and is still doing well today. And here is baby Esperanza. Baby Esperanza is an interesting story. So Esperanza's mother was an illegal immigrant crossing the border into Southern California in 1975. She gave birth and baby Esperanza developed meconium aspiration syndrome and subsequently went into PPHN, which at the time wasn't widely known exactly what was going on. However, Dr. Bartlett, who was caring for this patient, knew that she needed something 
additionally for her to survive because mechanical ventilation at that time was not successfully continuing the patient on the train of course. Interesting to note that Dr. Partlett called the mother in to sign the paperwork as this procedure had not been trialed successfully on a neonate at this time. Well, the mother being an illegal immigrant, I was understandably scared. She fled from the hospital and with no other family members around, Dr. Bartlett and the team decided they would place her on ECMO. Her medical team named her Esperanza, meaning hope. And after 72 hours on ECMO, she was successfully decannulated and she is still alive today. Now, back in that day in 1975, if you remember the history we talked briefly about earlier, well, we didn't have surfactant for use. We didn't have inhaled nitric oxide. And so a lot of the mainstays that we may take for granted as respiratory therapists today were not available. And this is where ECMO really got its start and was the hero because as we may or may not know, ECMO does not do anything. What it does is buy time for the patient to either get better or as a bridge, whether that's a bridge to heart transplant, lung transplant, could be a bridge to recovery or even a bridge to decision. What will we do with this patient moving forward? And here is the man, the myth, the legend, the father of modern ECMO, Dr. Robert Bartlett. Interestingly, a few years ago, Dr. Bartlett was quoted as saying this, the most useful part of all this research, and this research being ECMO, has not been to save thousands of patients, but the things we've learned about acute lung failure and acute heart failure that we now apply earlier to those patients. So our most successful patients are the ones who are referred to us for ECMO who get better without it. And I thought that was a really telling quote to hear from Dr. Bartlett, who devised this modern technology that we know today as ECMO, and that he refers to not just the heroics of the machine itself, but what we have learned as a medical society through the research and the use of this highly specialized life support equipment. Elso. You may have heard of ELSO. ELSO is the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization. Back in 1989, a steering committee was formed and the bylaws were established. ELSO, you can think of kind of as the governing body for ECMO, similar to AARC as the governing body for respiratory therapy. It began in the United States and has now spread globally. There are chapters that reach each continent. And as of this week, we have over 1,200 centers worldwide that have registered their ECMO programs with ELSO, which is pretty impressive. Here's a picture of a good friend of mine and mentor in both ECMO and respiratory care, Steve. In the early 1980s, when the hospital that I worked at in Boston decided that they were going to take on ECMO, my director at the time sat in a meeting with other hospital administrators and it was discussed who would take on the role of this ECMO specialist. 
Well, my boss at the time, who is a pioneer in the field of respiratory care, and a man I miss greatly, Dr. Robert Kazmarek, he stood up and said, we'll take it. And I remember talking to him about this a few years ago, saying, how did we get the ECMO team established as a respiratory therapist-based program? And he said, well, I stood up in a meeting and said, we'll do it for free. And God love him, that's what he did. And he worked to create other FTE positions, doing random things from biomedical engineering that we were responsible in the overnight shift to occasionally troubleshooting uh, heating blankets and cooling bank blankets to be able to get those funds so that he could provide us with an additional incentive. In this picture, Steve is caring for a young sheep. And I remember having a conversation with Steve after stumbling upon this picture and saying, Steve, talk to me a little bit about what's going on here. And he said, well, before we were doing ECMO on patients, we had to make sure we knew what we were doing. And so there was an animal lab across the street from the hospital. And I would spend the entire overnight shift with this Jeep who was wide awake on ECMO, I would monitor its vital signs and make adjustments to the ECMO system as necessary. I chuckled as well when he said, and the sheep cried all night long. <laughs> Gotta love it. So this is a look at ECMO in 2009. And why do I pick 2009? Well, that's when I was first checked off as an ECMO specialist. I began my training in 2008. And back at this time, there weren't as many ECMO runs as we see today. So it took over a year from my beginning classes as an ECMO specialist to being checked off through precepting and mentoring. What you see in the picture is a rather large machine. This is a Stockard S3 roller pump. And that white column that you see on the right-hand side of the picture, that is a silicone membrane oxygenator. Well, things have changed over time, but with this pump, blood drained from the patient's venous system into the roller pump, and it required gravity drainage, resulting in a siphon to the pump. It was servo-regulated, meaning that the gravity siphon did not cause an extreme negative pressure, creating cavitation and hemolysis, but rather pressures were set to either slow the pump down or stop it when extreme negative pressures were met, and likewise positive pressures. It was what we refer to as a positive displacement pump. So what we would do is we would use certain occlusion um, adjustments that were put in place depending on the size of the patient and the size of the tubing. And there was a roller mechanism that would move the pump by hitting different parts of the tubing and moving the blood forward. As you can imagine, over time, this would potentially cause the circuit to have small or at times large ruptures. So we would do what we called walking the raceway about every 72 to 96 hours. That entailed waiting until the entire medical team was there in the morning, including the surgeon that was responsible for the patient, holding your breath, or at least that's what I did, stopping the pump, moving the tubing forward so that it wouldn't be continual wear on one place in that tubing. Well, there were advantages and disadvantages to this pump. Disadvantage, I would attribute to it as it being gravity dependent. So it was limited by the height of the bed. Once we would get the patient on support, especially for our larger adult patients, the surgeon would be heard yelling, 
put the bed up, put the bed up, put the bed up, because the higher the bed, the more gravity drainage and the more flow we were able to achieve for our patients. And myself being vertically challenged, it was always interesting with an adult patient in the bed very high in the ICU, um, I might have occasionally needed a step stool to be able to listen to my patient's breath sounds, if there were any at that time, uh, when uh, taking a look at my patient after getting them on support. Talked a little bit about setting that occlusion, but also if that occlusion wasn't set properly before we put the patient on, the flow readings were inaccurate. So we could look at the patient's monitor and the patient's lab results and get an idea of what was going on, but we might not know if we were actually achieving the flow we thought we were. Well, those raceway ruptures from that repetitive compression from the occlusive roller pump, those were scary. And that happened to a number of us at that time uh, due to the technology and the plasticizers that was being used in the tubing. Silicone membrane oxygenators, well, they were a great adva advancement in ECMO from the bubble oxygenator or the film oxygenator that was used by Dr. Gibbon in his initial cardio, um, cardiopulmonary bypass machine. These silicone membrane oxygenators compared to the polymethylpentene ones we use today, well, there was more platelet adhesion, uh, there was increased clotting, there was more plasma leakage, and there wasn't the biocompatibility that we have today. There was no heparin bonding on the oxygenator and its components or albumin coating. And we know that clotting happens because the blood comes into contact with a foreign surface. And without the biocompatibility of, again, things such as heparin bonding on the plasticizer and albumin coating, we had a lot more clots and the circuit lives and oxygenators were a lot shorter than they are today. One of the advantages was servo, servo regulation. Part of the circuit was what we referred to as a bladder. It was just a small piece of kind of pliable tubing that sat in a holder on the floor and it represented the filling capacity of the patient's right atrium. And it would be that limiting uh, negative pressure, which in turn uh, would generate either a slow or a stop based on what our settings were for negative and positive pressures. And this is what ECMO looks like today. So here we have ECMO in 2024. On the top middle, you can see a device that is probably seen commonly in ICUs, uh, the CardioHelp. Right below it is the uh, Novalung. And then on the left is something a little bit newer to the market. That is the Spectrum. Um, blanking at the name of it. The Spectrum Quantum Elite workstation. These centrifugal pumps are what we refer to as preload dependent, afterload sensitive. So you need to have enough volume in it, in the patient to be able to support the pump. However, depending on what support your patient is on, if they are on heart and lung support, so VA ECMO, veno arterial ECMO, as the patient's native cardiac output improves, that then becomes an added pressure to the pump that is trying to deliver blood back to the patient. So that's what we mean when we refer to preload dependent and afterload sensitive. Bill James, who is a baseball statistician and author, tells a funny story of hungry cavemen sitting around a campfire waiting for tomatoes to ripen. And one has the inspiration to throw an ox on the fire and the first barbecue ensued and was endured. And after eating, conversation among the cavemen goes something like this. 
there were some good parts. Yeah, but there were some bad parts. And the smart one says, next time, let's not eat the bones. This anecdote to me illustrates the past, present, and future of ECMO. As it's a little bit like the cavemen and that first barbecued ox, when we look at not only anticoagulation, mechanical ventilation, but also patient selection over time. Rooted in cardiovascular surgery's holy grail of learning to repair arts, extracorporeal life support today is a result of well over half a century of passionate commitment. And it can sometimes be referred to as a unique result of ambitious attempt, evaluation, much debate, and more so today than in the days past, collaboration. When we look at centrifugal pumps, they're a little bit different than those roller pumps. They're non-inclusive, so we don't have to worry about that tubing constantly being compressed, having to stop the pump to move that tubing forward a little bit in order to not have a bloodbath. The impellers or cones are magnetically coupled and most have an electric motor and some are electromagnetic. We also talked a little bit about the preload dependent and afterload sensitive. I have to have volume in the bucket in order to pull it from. And so these non-occlusive pumps operate on the principle of entraining blood into the pump by a vortexing action, where spinning impeller blades or rotating cones and impellers, depending on which system you're using, when rotated rapidly, they generate a pressure differential that causes the movement of blood. Well, as is in any uh, medical field, especially today, we all strive to get on the same page. And so in 2019, the ELSO Maastricht Treaty for ECLS Nomenclature, it's a mouthful, uh, was published. And the consensus was reached by an international consortium of extracorporeal life support organization representatives. The abbreviations for cannulation configuration and extracorporeal life support clarified either peripheral cannulation, central cannulation, or a combination of central and peripheral cannulation, as well as parallel and independent devices. That sounds like a mouthful. So what do I mean by that? Well, if you see uh, the alphabet soup listed on the page, what that would mean is the nomenclature shows that the first cannula drains from the left femoral vein, and that is the V and then the FL, left femoral, with return flow via the right femoral artery. So you see artery, femoral, femoral right, and a distal perfusion cannula in the right groin. Distal perfusion is just to make sure that there is continual blood flow going to the lower leg uh, because it is sometimes impeded by the cannula and the blood flow coming from the circuit returning to the patient. You'll see a slash and then the second circuit. This is a patient on two separate circuits that are running at the same time drains from the jugular veins. So you see the jugular and the V and a return cannula with its tip in the right atrium and return flow via the subclavian ar artery where the return cannula is actually put into a chimney graph. So why, why this complication? Why this alphabet soup? Well, I should be able to board a plane in Connecticut, where I'm located, and head over to Australia to be able to support staffing for an ECMO team there. And when I arrive there, 
I should be able to know by looking at this alphabet soup exactly what's going on with the patient instead of my nomenclature being a little bit different than your nomenclature and there being confusion about exactly what support the patient truly is on. Well, living in the Northeast, I am a Sox fan. Go Sox! Uh, and working at Mass General Hospital, uh, we did a retrospective study that was published in 2019. Um, and that showed that once we had formalized a multidisciplinary ECMO team, we showed an increase in survival to discharge by over 14%. Well, what do I mean by that? Back when I started doing ECMO, we would... Uh, support the patient in whatever unit they were placed on ECMO in. Well, that could be the neuro ICU, the burn ICU, surgical ICU, cardiac, medical, pediatric, the list goes on and on. The interesting uh, dynamics of that is that while the ECMO specialists were respiratory therapists and worked in all of these different units, the nursing staff and physician might never have seen an ECMO patient. And ECMO patients are a little bit different uh, to care for than your typical ICU patient. And research has shown that patient outcomes, so survival rates and complications, are closely related to the volume of cases and the multidisciplinary team involved in their care. This is a picture that was taken a few years back. This is a 16-year-old at Children's Mercy Hospital um, on ECMO for ARDS, of unknown etiology, who is seen ambulating on a high-flow nasal cannula. Well, back in the day when I started training as an ECMO specialist, all of our patients were sedated, muscle relaxed. We didn't change uh, the bed sheets. We didn't turn the patient unless the surgeon and the entire medical team is here. We never would have considered extubating a patient. And so we can see that it's really evolved over time. And early mobilization on patients is so very important. We really must aim to see patients thrive, not just survive post ECMO. So what does the future of ECMO look like? Well, there's a lot of thoughts on this. So there's the thought that total automation and servo regulation uh, will be the wave of the future in which the system will adjust its pump flow and sweep gas automatically to maintain a desired set of physiological parameters and doing so in a safe manner. Wearable VV ECMO devices. And we'll see that coming up in an oncoming slide, but that's also something interesting to consider moving forward. Seeing circuits and their components with increased biocompatibility. Well, we do know that nitric oxide is found in our tissue endothelium, and that helps with platelets sticking to our vessels. So it has been investigated, it is currently being investigated to produce a nitric oxide eluding plasticizer that will be built into not only ECMO circuits, but their components such as the membrane lung and the pump head. ECMO specialists no longer required to sit at bedside. Mm, that sounds interesting as well. Well, the thought is that ECMO will potentially be run by the bedside nurse, but that there will be a need for more highly trained ECMO specialists as not only the supervising team, but educators and managers of circuit emergencies. So kind of, I like to equilibrate that to mechanical ventilators, right? When we are taking care of patients in the ICU, we might be responsible for three, maybe even 10 ventilators. We're not going to sit at the bedside one-to-one -one with each mechanical ventilator, right? 
we have the nurse at the bedside caring for the patient. And if there's something going on and we're across the unit, the nurse will either page us or call overhead for us to come over. And that's kind of the same process with uh, the way ECMO is actually moving in the future. Next is ECOR, also referred to as respiratory dialysis, which I am not a fan of that term as, as much as I am uh, not a fan of the term pulmonary toilet, to be honest with you. But extracorporeal CO2 removal is like a modified ECMO circuit, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And also paracorporeal support, and we'll get into that a little further. Well, that doesn't look like a machine of the future now, does it? This is a Rhone Poulenc. But the thought is that the ideal pump for long-term ECMO, which is yet to be created, would be derived from this Rhone Poulenc pump that was designed in France in the 1970s. It's an interesting alternative to the centrifugal pumps that we use today or their predecessors, which are still used in different patient populations and institutions, the roller pumps. This machine is a non-occlusive pressure regulated pump and its specific design chamber allows the pump to generate a pulsatile flow compared to continuous flow that we see with our ECMO machines today. The advantage of that is reducing hemolysis, could act as a bubble trap, and really making it inherently safe. And this is a template for that type of pump that is being worked on uh, referred to as a peristaltic passive filling paracorporeal design pump, which is a mouthful that essentially says it is one that is pulsatile, servo regulated, and totally automated uh, that will have algorithms built into it based on feedback from the patient. Well, here's that wearable VV ECMO device. Um, unfortunately, in a surprising turn of events this week, the manufacturer of this device uh, let the global community know that this product will be coming to end of product life at the end of this year so that they can focus on their new cardiopulmonary bypass machine that has recently come to market. But it's an interesting prototype and one that I'm sure we will see more similar things come out in the future. Talking a little bit about that nitric oxide uh, as an inhibitor of platelet activity through cyclic GMP mechanisms, well, that, you know, that's a little bit, I think, over my head to get into the description of it, but just know that that is part of our overall uh, process in our natural tissue endothelium. And some may say that we're not ECMO specialists, but we are endotheliologists. So there is a fine line between clotting and bleeding in ECMO, and we are trying to prevent the patient from either bleeding to death or clotting to death. And those biocompatibility and anticoagulation factors are something that we continually look at moving forward. So look at those uh, people all in that heart. So that is me and the ECMO team at Mass General Hospital a uh, number of years back uh, out as a team building at a Red Sox game. We talked a little bit as ECMO specialists will maybe not be at the bedside per se, sitting one-to-one -one with our patients, right, moving forward. As an ECMO specialist, uh, when I was clinical at the bedside, we were responsible for up to three ECMO patients at a time. However, due to staffing constraints, or I remember one night shift starting with three ECMO patients, and by the end of the shift, I had five, because we had put three other patients on throughout the course of the night shift and staffing had changed a lot. But just know that there are a lot more paths opening up and many that are in this picture today 
have moved on and are either ECMO coordinators or clinical specialists for medical device company or consultants and maybe even sales directors like myself for independent ECMO companies. Here's a look at eCore. And again, uh, the company that has designed this one device that is available in the US has sadly said that it will come to end of product life similar to the other device uh, at the end of 2024. Um, but what it is really looking at is either the ability to uh, completely bypass mechanical ventilation or use it as an adjunct and get ventilator settings down in some of our patients that are very difficult to treat. So think of your COPD exacerbation uh, patients. When they come in in an acute exacerbation, most of us know from experience, once they get intubated, they are very hard to get off the ventilator. So that is the thought process behind eCore. It is much lower flows than we provide in ECMO and is simply uh, used for CO2 removal. Supernova trial came out a few years back and it actually showed that using this eCore device um, showed a 73% survival rate at 28 days and 62% survival rate at hospital discharge for those enrolled. So something that falls into our wheelhouse as respiratory therapists. It'll be interesting to see how this progresses moving forward. Another trial that is currently closed but has not been published yet is the Ventivoid trial. And that's one that is being uh, processed in the United States. So it's hoping to show the feasibility of ventilator avoidance primarily in the treatment of acute exacerbations of COPD. The intent is to enroll 40 hospitals and up to 800 patients to get a clear picture of how this can be beneficial for especially that patient population. When we talk about paracorporeal support, paracorporeal, extracorporeal, they're pretty interchangeable. We hear the word paracorporeal more with LVAD, so left ventricular assist device, and we hear extracorporeal, of course, more with ECMO. But they both refer to having most of the device outside the body, with that piece inside the body being the cannulas in the patient's vessels. The Paracorporeal Ambulatory Assist Lung, or PAL. Uh, the development is underway at the University of Pittsburgh, and that's through a grant through the NIH, the Nas uh, National Institute of Health. And it's intended to support longer term, so they're thinking up to three months in a patient while awaiting transplant. When you think of cardiac support, we're able to send our patients home with LVADs. This is along the same lines but for those patients uh, awaiting lung transplant. And here is the pediatric version of it that is currently underway as well. This is a picture of ECMO being instituted in the subway in Paris. So eCPR might be a term that you're hearing more frequently, extracorporeal CPR. Uh, this was actually uh, a team that was deployed in Paris. Interesting to think of where uh, ECLS is moving forward. How about in the Louvre? Can you imagine assisting a team, uh, putting a patient on ECMO with the Mona Lisa, maybe hanging off to the side? And what about this? This is a design currently being considered and it involves a semi-truck tractor uh, attached to a large ambulance. So it's similar to an expandable RV, if you wanna picture that in your mind. Fully equipped with lights, sirens for emergency response, and it will have hydraulically activated RV type sliders that when, dis when deployed, uh, will transform the ambulance into a fully functional cardiac cath lab. Uh, 
And they have something similar to that currently in Minnesota. First ECMO home care company. Well, I've always joked that uh, I will open the first ECMO home care company. And you know what? That might be a possibility moving forward. You just never know. Interestingly, at the end of last year in December, the American Heart Association, who had recommended that eCPR, so extracorporeal CPR, could be an adjunct therapy um, when looking at ACLS, now has changed its uh, thoughts based on some new studies uh, done especially in Minnesota by Dr. Yiannopoulos and his team, and has actually moved it up so that it can be re reasonable and not just something considered uh, moving forward. So that's a big step for ECMO and the eCPR uh, society. Here are some of the RT ECMO specialists uh, that I have worked with that really talk about how becoming an ECMO specialist has really changed their career, expanding either their clinical practice and knowledge or moving from home care into neopedes and then ECMO and continually learning, which is something that we will all do in the medical field. So if you're unsure about where your career path will lead you as an RT, I encourage you to consider ECMO. We are seeing more opportunities for RT ECMO specialists outside of the hospital as uh, ECMO continues to uh, gain popularity and improve outcomes for our patients. So in essence, think about choosing ECMO as part of your career path because the sky is the limit. And I'll end with uh, this picture, which I find uh, interesting because it kind of uh, takes a look at both sides of the RT, both uh, as a bedside RT and the ECMO specialist. As an RT, we're excited for air to be moving in a patient's ventilator circuit. As an ECMO specialist, we are terrified to see air uh, in our ECMO circuit. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you so much.